Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is doing great. Hope you're having an unbelievable weekend. Look, this is not going to be long, but this is another installment. I told you I was going to keep things coming uh, with relevant uh, and current information uh, to keep us informed, uh, inspired, encouraged, and educated. Uh, from a number of different angles and perspectives based off of my years of experience, uh, my ex expertise in human behavior, uh, and so much more. So here we go. Um, there's an African proverb that says, and I could be m misquoting it, uh, a lot's going on in my head right now, uh, but it says that when the child can't feel the love of the village, he will burn it down to feel its warmth. Uh, and all I can get every time that I read that now or I come across it in reading and research or just, you know, in, in, in perousing information, uh, the first thing that goes through my mind is the village is on fire. We consistently look at the current state of affairs and we look at the behavior of our children specifically our young males and we shake our heads we go oh my god we talk about how things used to be and we talk about how horrible things have become and how our children have just completely lost it and we don't take time to look at the underlying current of force and impact that is driving their behavior. For more than 20 years, I have endeavored to understand African-American adolescent and young adult male violence, also other Af African-American male impulsive behaviors. And to understand not just our young boys, but our grown men, I have spent hours upon hours in scientific research and studies and uh, imp imp peer reviewing uh, empirical data and in, in, in developing an understanding. And one of the things that I came across was this uh, work being done by Dr. Howard Stevenson. And then I ran into Dr. Joy DeGruy in the process. And so I decided to uh, bring together their work and, 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 and out of it came Black Men Lead, a rite of passage initiative. And I want to challenge everybody to support our work because it's so important to touch the lives of these young boys. And I'm gonna talk to you about girls tomorrow, but I'm talking about boys today and what it turns out to be. And when we look at what we see to be a failure in black manhood, we have to understand that it has an origin, that we have to understand that we are living a, a dynamic life experience that produces results and that we have to be able to manage that for our children. I've talked to you about adverse childhood experiences and I shared you more than more one time that I have worked with places like Harris County Sheriff's Office, Wellspring Clinic, um, and others dealing with epigenetics, which is genetic, uh, the genetic uh, predisposition for trauma, the genetic predisposition for disease, the genetic uh, precursor to uh, traumatic experiences, and also the facilitator of multi-generational trauma. And so it's so much that goes on into that, but I've also studied how we are getting here. And Dr. Stevenson uncovered, he is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And in his work, what he was able to uncover about adolescent violence, well, I took it a step further. And I also looked into young adult male violence. And as we're moving out of puberty into adolescence and out of adolescence into young adulthood, the things that we experience, well, Here's the, here, here, here's the general thing that we took from uh, Dr. Stevenson, whose broad shoulders I stand uh, to be able to talk about this in depth and from an educated perspective. Look, there are five pro predominant precursors that allow us to predict the risk of violence in an African-American uh, adolescent and young adult for that matter. So walk with me. I'm gonna go from five to one. Number five, urban hassle. 
What is urban hassle? Urban hassle is uh, the things that you get in the inner city, uh, having to navigate gang violence to get to and from school, having to navigate drug activity to get to and from school, hearing gunshots all times of the day and night, sirens all times of the day and night in areas like the Midwest and the Northeast, uh, L trains running by apartment and tenement buildings at uh, all times of the day and night and all of the other things that just simply comes with being within the inner city that that can literally agitate the nervous system to a level that it puts kids on edge and then you take the natural progressive development of a young black male where the rise of testosterone is taking place a natural aggression is developing a sense of identity is lacking all of these things are important and then you plug in urban urban hassle and it puts them on edge. the next thing is uh witnessing violence the more you witness violence the more desensitized you become to it the more it becomes a model of behavior for certain things so when you see somebody committing violence because of a certain thing and you see it over and over again then it becomes the model of behavior for that thing and becomes eventually an instinctive response to things and so and then there is the lower threshold of conscious the more desensitized you become to violence the less the act of violence bothers you and so that's another one then the next one is being a victim of violence we know from research and all the extant data uh that we have available that we are t uh the more that a young male is a victim the more at risk he is of being violent uh, that is extremely important and m even more prevalent within the African-American uh, community. So we must understand that. And then here are the golden two. Number two, the lack of proper racial socialization. Uh, I cannot talk on this any more emphatically and passionately than I have in the past. I've written on it, I've spoken on it, I've talked about the importance of a rite of passage for the purpose of ra proper racial socialization. Why? Because we understand that a black male who has not been properly racially socialized is five times more likely to commit, commit violence than one who has. He is less likely to finish school. He is less, more likely to go to prison, less likely to develop the skill set to be able to uh, earn a, a, a living wage and support a family. And he's definitely less likely to become a business owner and become a uh, pro-social contributor to the black community. On the other hand, when we properly racially socialize young black males, they do become uh, pro-social uh, they complete school, they become more aware, they develop skills that allow them to make a living. They are less likely to become incarcerated and in situations where they may get caught up in a poor decision, they are more likely not to recidivate uh, after the first mistake. So all these things are prevalent, especially when you consider that there are 1.5 million men missing and 1.3 of those are incarcerated. We have to be aware of what's going on. We can't just keep saying, oh, my God, we've got to sit up and we've got to understand what really, truly is happening. OK, so. Number one is the feeling of being disrespected, man. If you were to stroll through the hallways and annals of uh, the average prison uh, unit. And you were to survey those are there for violent crimes. Everything from assault to murder, what you would find is outside of the rapists, and even in some case the rapists, but outside the rapists, those that are committed violent crimes in some way felt disrespected. There's nothing that drives the need of the heart of the, uh, of the push of a man than respect. It is his greatest yearning. I, I try to teach this to young women all the time. And so, sisters, if you hear this, listen to me very cleverly because this never leaves. It goes from at a very early age up until he passes away at an old age. He wants to be respected more than he wants to be loved. 
He needs to feel needed more than he wants to be loved. He needs to have a place where he knows he fits. That's why it's so important to properly socialize, to properly give a, 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 a sense of value and worth to these young brothers before they come of age. Why? Because if they have a sense of identity, then they know who they are. They know what their responsibilities are. They know why they need to behave a certain way. They know what they're supposed to do. And they have the guidance and the leadership and the moral to do it. We have failed them in so many different ways. And we must own that if we're ever going to right the ship. Well, in, in studying this, here's what I discovered. I discovered that it's real hard to manage the respect dynamic because everybody defines respect differently. And it's hard to get a grasp on that Um in, in, in totality at a level that you can really truly manage it. Now, you can use the respect scale, which actually Dr. Joy DeGruy created, uh, the first African-American adolescent respect scale, literally uh, questions and observations you can make about any young black male that'll give you an idea of their risk for committing violence and allow you to predict uh, almost when, if, or, or and if and when they're going to commit violence and allow you to have interventions that are effective. And we have the interventions. We know what works with them when they're on edge. And we can literally do something about that. This is so important. People are putting in the work to make changes that can save our boys. And we're simply not investing in it. We're simply not buying into it. We're simply sitting back and taking the natural old approach that we've taken down the years complain complaining is not a strategy complaining is not a plan complaining does not provide any type of relief or solution from any problem it never has it never will so then what must we do? We must evaluate. We must gain an understand it. We must gain a very lucid perspicacity in, in, uh, uh, in, of, uh, and awareness of what's going on so that we build strategies, so that we build uh, programs, so that we build types of engagements and interventions that allow us to intercept this behavior, to thwart this behavior, to replace this behavior. And it's possible. We do it. I know it's possible. I work with young men. And I'm going to tell you something, whether it's the inner city where it's more prevalent or the more affluent black kids with the parents who have become successful and moved away from the hood and moved in affluent communities, there's a different type of frustration taking place. There's a different type of disruption taking place. It, 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 it It's not the same, but it is. It, it's not the same in that it's not the navigating uh, violence, gang violence and drug activity, although drugs are very prevalent in affluent schools, especially pills and marijuana, very, very prevalent in schools. And so they're navigating it, but they're navigating it in a different way. And the, but but their, their struggle is in the, the same thing, lack of socialization. Why? Because socialization brings about what? A sense of identity, a sense of being able to discover and understand who you are. If you don't understand who you are, you struggle. And he, 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 let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Roughly around the age of 14 or 15 years old, men, regardless of regardless of race, young boys start to really peer into manhood. They're in their adolescence. They are solidly in their adolescent stage and they're starting to peer into manhood. And this is where you'll see what a lot of kids go astray. A lot of kids start to act up. Parents say, I don't know what happened. He was such a good kid. And he's and it, it, here's why. When you get to this stage, this is where young males start to peer into their manhood. And there are some things they need in order to keep them stable, in order to keep them focused, in order to keep them aligned. They need a sense of identity. They need to know who they are. They need to know who they are and an awareness of how they function and relate to the world. First and foremost, they're going to need some type of spiritual guidance. How, how do they align with God as they know them? 
So it's it's not about your one particular religion. It's about the religion they were brought up in, whatever that may be. How do they relate to God? How do they see God? Do they see God as, in, as having forsaken them? As they Do they see God as somewhere distant off? Do they see God as not like them? And it's real big problem for blacks. Why? Because the image of God has been pushed on us so much as being Caucasian that it's hard to relate to. And we never give it any consideration. If you go anywhere else in the world, I've had the blessing of being able to travel the world. You go anywhere else in the world and their physical image of God, even though you really can't put God in, in, in that image, we all try to. It's a natural human instinct. But their image of God looks like them. Why? It's so important to the connectivity and the understanding of the power of God working in their lives. And they did this without even knowing it, but they did it also because it was natively there. Most of these gods were created within the land they are. So all everybody looks alike. So they made God look like them. We weren't, we didn't have that luxury. We came from a people who were kidnapped. We came from a people who were uprooted. We came from a people who had their values, their interests, their principles ripped from them, their identity tucked from them, their 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 their, their, their identity re reestablished under a Eurocentric idea of what is. Now, this isn't one of those blame the white people thing. This is one of those things where you've got to understand what's wrong with you. Forget who did it. Forget all of that because blaming them doesn't change what you need to change within yourself. And this is what we need to be working on with our boss. But what happens? He needs this thing with God, but he also needs to have some idea of what am I going to do with myself? What am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to be? Now, we all know that we change our minds when we sit up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But we need to have a sense of self. And why is it so important for him to have a, I'm going to do this. See, I knew uh, by this time that I was either going to be an attorney or I was going to be a psychologist. I didn't know which yet, but I knew that I was just really head embedded because that I knew who I was. I knew how my mind worked. I knew what I was good at. I was very familiar with my gift. I had worked with people who allowed me to explore it, who pushed me into it. So when I got to this point and I started to search myself, it wasn't difficult for me. I, hey, this is what I'm going to do, one of these two things. And it wasn't but a year later, uh, say 14, 15, by 16, 17, I, I was locked into psychology, thank the doc, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. But here we go. So if he doesn't know who he is, if he doesn't have a real sure connection with God, if he hasn't had a real sound uh, idea of self-awareness, his self-image is sort of thrown in a, in a bunch of different ways. He's going to have problems with self-esteem, self-confidence, and a bunch of other things. But here's what's also going to happen. Because his mind is yearning at a very deep level, and his brain is thriving and pushing and searching for this thing that his mind is yearning for, and he can't find it, he becomes disruptive. Now we already know that he's going to be, if he's still in school, he's going to be in school where the teaching population is predominantly what white middle-aged women who are already afraid of him. So now if he hasn't already been pushed into special education um, evaluations, uh, it's definitely going to be a push. Now why? Because they don't want him in the classroom. They want anything and any reason to have him out of the classroom. And then if we're not careful, we're talking about him being diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD, both of which are normally treated with psychotropic drugs like Vyvanse, Concerta, uh, Adderall, Ritalin, and, and on and on. And these are Schedule II drugs, meaning they're highly addictive and have very little medicinal purpose outside of making your kids sit there like a zombie and not disrupt the classroom. Well, nobody's asking why. Just stop it. Do whatever you got to do to stop it. And because the average parent doesn't understand and we have been conditioned as a people to respect authority and we look at teachers and school psychologists and school administrators as having authority in that area. And if you say that's what my kid needs is an IEP, well, then, OK, I'm going to go ahead and sign these 
papers that allow you to do this and then I realized afterwards that's not what he needed but now I can't get him out so now he's frustrated with school I mean listen it's easy to point the finger it's easy to point the finger what we need to be doing is we need to be organizing we need to be engaging these kids I've been talking to people uh, for the last month or so about the importance of having a universal rite of passage. Why? Because we need to have a universal definition of what manhood is. We need to have something to... See, we got so much going on now. We got the body in the bag. I'm going to talk about that probably tomorrow. The body in the bag where men are being defined by their bank account and women being defined by their body the woman want the man with the bag so she's got to get the body we got the body in the bag and nobody's developing into anything more than somebody chasing money and somebody trying to look like uh whatever they need and we are losing ourselves and trying to be something we are not there's nothing wrong with being wealthy there's nothing wrong with having a nice figure but sisters you're built like goddesses you are goddesses you are literally the standard that's what kills me you're the standard but they got you chasing something unrealistic and it's and it's so profound and it's so real and it's so intentional and brothers they've got us settling for money and thinking our money gives us a reason to fall off on the other responsibilities. You are supposed to be a protector before you are a provider. Think about it. And we teach our boys in Black Men Lead. Think about it. When you are seven, eight, nine, you and your female counterpart of the same age are pretty much equal. Y'all run and race, she may beat you. Y'all get into a wrestling match, she may beat you. But all of a sudden, 10, 11, things start to change you start to grow at a rapid pace you are now naturally more physically uh, stronger than she is what's happening your body is starting to now produce testosterone now we tell we tell our young boy says there are going to be a couple of things that are going to happen when you start to go through puberty the first thing you're probably going to notice is that your voice is going to start to change it's going to go through this little squeaky scratchy point then it's going to start to get deeper why is that the voice is the first defense mechanism for a man. The deeper the voice, the more intimidating he is. It's a bunch of people that get scared off solely by the voice. It definitely works when you're keeping them little knuckleheads away from your daughter. Well, that's the first thing is the voice. But then you realize that you're stronger than she is. But you also notice you're a little more edgy now. You got a little bit more aggressiveness to you. You're a little bit ready to tangle more than you used to be. What's that? That's the aggression that makes you willing to use the new physical power you have to protect her. She is not your enemy. She's not for you to attack. She's not for you to conquer. She's not for you to control. She is for you to cover. But see, they're not talking about covering when we are evaluating our manhood. They're not talking about uh, 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 protecting when we are evaluating our manhood. They're not talk about speaking into the lives of the people in your house from your wife down to your child. They're not talking about the importance of identity and how you speak into your children's life, how you connect the divine essence of God to your home. You are the priest. But they don't talk about that. Get the bag. Getting it, we, We've been told over the last five years or six years that having the bag makes you a high value man. Having the bag puts you in a position to be a provider, which is an extremely important part of manhood. But it doesn't make you a high value man. What makes you a high value man is that you have influence in your community, that you have the capacity to protect, to provide, to cover, to lead, to be a priest, to be a representation of God in your home and in your community, that makes you a high value man. That when your woman looks at you, she feels safe. That when your children look at you, your son see what they want to be and your daughter see who they want to marry, that makes you a man. But we've got to have a universal rite of passage. 
I've had people in a number of different cities who have contacted me about bringing black men lead and I'll take it anywhere. I'll teach it to anybody, but we need it universal. Uh, and, 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 and here's what I told them and I'll tell anybody else. It's not about having my name on it or having my brand on it. It's about having a universal rite of passage. Call it what you want, put it where you want, say who, say you made it up. I don't care. What I do care is that I don't want our little boys growing up without the right type of guidance, without the right type of modeling. Because what they do is they become broken men. What did what did what did Frederick Douglass tell us? He says it's easier to build strong children than it is to fix broken men. And here we are. The village is on fire. Remember what I told you in the beginning? When the child cannot feel the love of the village, he will set it on fire. He will burn it down to feel its warmth. They don't know why they're doing it. And then there's this whole external exogenous bombardment of negative things that are giving them ideas of how to be destructive. It's in the music. It's in the media presentation. Drug use, misogyny, fratricide. Kill, kill, get high, beat up, rape, kill, disrespect, kill, kill. Show how many bands you got, kill, kill. But they don't show what it looks like inside at the same frequency. Now, they got, you know, locked up in a couple of other these shows, but they're not showing the frequency. They're showing the Lamborghinis. They're showing, they're showing the Phantoms and the Ghosts. They're showing the Bentleys. They're showing the Maseratis. They're showing the, the Rovers. They're showing all this stuff, but they're not showing the 25 years to life. They're not showing what it's like when you're not getting visits and you're not getting mail and, 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 and you're about to just lose it. They're not showing what it's like when you don't get to choose when you wake up and when you go to sleep. They're not showing the lack of humanity that you're experiencing and being institutionalized into. That's our responsibility to build this, to create this, to grow this, to make it into something that we can literally empower our children. This is our responsibility. It, 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 it's not their responsibility. Malcolm told us that only a fool expects his enemy to educate his children to compete with theirs. Yet here we are. The village is on fire. The village is on fire. Look, I'm going to get off of here, uh, get out, and get my head clear. I got a lot to do this weekend. Uh, and I've been going this morning since 530. I'm going to take a quick break and I'm going to get back to it. But I had to bring this to you. We are losing because we're unengaged. We're losing because we're not committed. We're losing because we want somebody else to fix what we're responsible for fixing. We're losing because we talk a good game, but we have no execution. We are losing because we are the most gifted, unpurposed people in the, in the history of this world. We simply are unstoppable, but we won't move. Let the image of that set in your mind. You're unstoppable, but you won't move. If they spend their entire thought processes, 1,300 plus think tanks, figuring out how to keep you from the move, to move from moving, because they know once you start moving, they can't do jack with you. They distract you with stuff. They distract you with entertainment. And they filter in the little subliminal messages that program you into docility, compliance, and lethargy. And here you sit, the most powerful people on the planet, 
acting without potency because you don't know who you are. It's time to show our boys who they are. It's time to show our daughters who they are. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to change. Through Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative, we will continue to do this work. Uh, we will continue to do work uh, in the mental health realm. We will continue to do work with our girls with uh, suffering from incest, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and on. We'll continue to work in areas of empowerment and training. We will keep answering the bell. Here's my challenge to you. Support the work we do. support the work we do I could easily present three different research pro uh, proposals that require 250 300,000 minimum to do the people who could fund them won't fund them because they don't want the answers my people won't fund them so I have to slowly go through it on my dime and I've been doing this for 30 years Go through it on my dime at my pace, and I will. If I die doing the work, I'll pass the work on to somebody else. But what I won't do is fold. What I won't do is give up. Sometimes I look at this and I go, God, why did you give me this? You know, the selfish side of me, that old part of the Rick that used to be, the one that, you know, was all about what I'm doing in me. Be like, man, man, you know what I could be doing right now? But ain't no legacy in that. Ain't no legacy in turning up whatever the term is this year. Ain't no legacy in new whips every month. Ain't no legacy in it. Trash. Waste. The legacy is in the lives you touch and the lives you change and the hopes you restore. When I leave this place, I'm going to leave on E. And I'm going to have given it everything I've got. If I live another 40 years, you're going to get another 26 plus books. Easy. I'm, I'm, I'm shooting for 100. I don't know if I'm going to get that, but that's it. I'm at 26. I got a long way to go. But I'm dropping two more this year. And I plan on writing three next year. Yeah. I go. Because why? I might not make up, I might not wake up tomorrow. And if that's the case, I want to know I gave this life everything I have. And I gave my people my best. That I stood on the backs of the Martins, the the, the Malcolms, the Medgars, the Marcuses, the, the, the Carter G. Woodsons, the Khaled Muhammads, the Amos Wilsons, the, the Naeem Agbars, the Francis Chris Wilsons. That I stood on their shoulders and I did something with what they gave me. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Thank you so much for letting me have your time. If you believe in the work that we're doing, if you believe in what I just talked about, if you want to see a change, look in the description box and literally support the work we're doing. That's my challenge to you. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.